Okay, so like I said, this one, the main difference is that we're going to be dealing with two populations or treatments. So first, we're going to look at... We're going to look at differences concerning the difference. And you know, why is he emphasizing the word difference? Difference between two population or treatment means using independent samples. The word difference between means with independent samples. Later on this week, we'll look at difference between means but with dependent samples. So just to recap, independent versus dependent. What does it mean to be dependent? One affects the other. That's right. So for today and tomorrow, we'll be talking about independent means. Okay, so let's just kind of jump into it. We'll set the stage using an example. Suppose we have a population of adult men with a mean height of 71 inches and a standard deviation of 2.5 inches. We also have a population of adult women with a mean height of 65 inches and a standard deviation of 2.3 inches. Let's assume that the heights are normally distributed. Now, we want to take a random sample of 30 men and a random sample of 25 women from their respective populations and calculate the difference in their heights. Meaning, we want to take a man's height and subtract a woman's height from it. If we did this many, many, many times, what would the distribution of differences look like? Do I have any ideas, maybe? I know we just started, but... I think it would look normal. Everything else has, hasn't it? <laughs> One could hope. Yeah, it would be. But let's investigate this in detail. So for the male heights, we have a normal curve. Here's our mean. There's our standard deviation. Same thing for the females. There's our mean. There's our standard deviation. Now, if we're doing samples, Remember, when you take a sample, you have to divide the standard deviation by the square root of your sample size to get a sampling distribution. So we took samples of size 30 from the males, and this would be our new sampling distribution. The mean stayed the same, standard deviation changed. Similar thing with females. Except we want only 25 females. Mean stayed the same. Standard deviation had to be adjusted. Now, we're going to randomly take one sample from the males and one sample from the females and find their difference. So, this is one male sample minus one female sample. Now let's say we did that over and over and over and over again. We would end up with this distribution, the sampling distribution of the differences. And we would have a difference has a mean of six. 
trying to rewrite this better. I tried to write that. You can't really see it that well, but right here I tried to write mu of x bar at m minus x bar at. I tried to write mu of this. You just can't really see it that well. What is mu of x bar? So this is saying it's the population mean of all of our differences here. What is the one that you can read? The two on the bottom call is mu x bar. Mu of x bar m minus x bar f. It's basically a mu and then as a subscript I wrote this. Gotcha. And then this monstrosity over here is our new standard deviation. So we took the standard deviation of the sampling distribution for men and squared it, plus the sampling distribution standard deviation for females and squared it, and then took the square root of it all. Why is it plus and not minus? So that goes back to our variances. I can't remember what chapter we talked about it in. Uh, I don't know if you remember when we were doing the linear combinations. That was maybe chapter four. So essentially what, what we would have to do is I'll do it over here in the blank space. So sigma of x m bar minus x bar f. That's equal, or sigma squared, sorry. That's going to be equal to sigma of x bar m. But then, because we're doing variance, we have that a negative 1 in front, so we have to square the negative 1 and do sigma, sorry, that should be squared, sigma squared x bar f. You remember something like that where we had to square the A's in front? I wish somebody would look at it. I have my binder, my big binder. Uh, that way I could give you a chapter reference. I'm thinking it's chapter four. That's all right. Yeah. For the differences, it will be plus. Oh, it was chapter four. XM minus XF.
find it for you that way. Chapter seven. Now that I now that I see it. Chapter seven is where we looked at it. That's what it was. Seven four. Now section seven point four. So if we're wrong. We are wanting a reference. Uh huh. Let me four. Where we talk about the linear combinations of mean and variance. You get draw in or you still? <laughs> okay, so let's describe the sampling distribution of the differences in mean heights between men and women. So the sampling distribution would be normally distributed with the mean, as we saw, the mean is six, but how did they get six? They did mu up x m x bar m minus the mu of x bar f that gave us our mean of six and then we already talked about how we got this standard deviation sum so this 2.5 over the square root of 30 let's just sigma x bar m This would be sigma x bar f. We have to square it, add them together, and then take the three. So what is this equal to? Because we're going to need it here in a second. So what's our you know, deviation equal to? If we type that in the calculator, what do we get for sigma? Point six four eight. Okay, so what's the probability then, since we know our new mean, we know our new standard deviation, what's the probability that the difference in mean heights of a random sample of 30 men and 25 women is less than 5 inches? 
So let's think about what this is asking. This is asking the probability of the difference in heights. So x m bar minus x f bar is less than 5. That's what it's asking us to find. Well, we know it has a normal distribution. We said, that's what we said on the previous slide, or right up above, actually. Sampling distribution is normally distributed. So we can standardize and use our Z tables. The probability that Z is less than Five minus six divided by six four eight. And since we're going to need to look this up in our Z table, let's do it to two decimal places, please. Why the six? Why the six? Because that's our mean up here. We're kind of going for a second back to just old school calculating z-scores. Mm -hmm. 0.74 is what you got for your z-score? That's the probability. What's the actual z score itself? Negative 1.54. Perfect. <laughs> and then what did we say the probability was? Zero six one eight. Perfect. That's our probability. So that's how you would do this finding probabilities. But we can actually take this and then turn this into a hypothesis test setup. So let's flip over to the next page and talk about some terminology. Okay, that's kind of a rhetorical question, but I'll ask it anyways. How many of y'all function better when you're organized? Any of y'all? I do. And then even when I'm working problems, I have to keep my problems organized. So the reason I mention that is, yes, these tables are to help us with notation. But when you're working problems, I highly recommend writing the information given in the form of the table. Taking it out of the problem, putting it into a table so you know exactly what you're looking at. Because when you read a problem and it just starts throwing all these numbers at you, you're going to be like, okay, wait, what, what, what was that number? What was this number? Just put it into a table form. So for our notation, if we have a population, two different populations, let's call them population one and two. Okay, where's my all red dot? There it is. One and two. The mean of it would be, like if it's population one, mu sub one. Population two, mu sub two. And then similar story for variance and standard deviation. So this is the variance of population one, variance of population two, etc. That's for populations. So what are we usually doing with? Populations or samples? 
samples. So here's our notation for samples. It's really, again, kind of self-explanatory. You have two treatments. Let's call them treatment one and treatment two, or population one, population two. We use the same variables that we're familiar with in x bar, s squared for variance, s for standard deviation. We just add a subscript in there to tell us what population we're talking about. Now, for me personally, these ones and twos still can kind of confuse me if I don't define what it is. I mean, I'm more of a fan of saying if I'm dealing with brand A and brand B, I use one and two. Use A and B, then that way I can keep this straight and I don't have to remember what one and two are. But that's just personal preference. Okay, so let's look at some properties. If the random samples on which X bar 1 and X bar 2 are based are selected independently of one another, I'm going to circle the word independent. That's important. That would be independent. Then the mean, the mean of their differences is simply the difference of the mean. The mean of the difference is the difference of the mean. Is timing, yes. That's X1 and X2? Yes, yes. The sampling distribution of X1 bar minus X2 bar is always centered at the value of mu1 minus mu2. So that way, the difference of the sample means is an unbiased statistic. Remember, we don't want to introduce bias or give a biased statistic. We want to keep things as unbiased as possible. So now for variance and standard deviation. Here's our formula for the variance. So sigma squared of x bar 1 minus x bar 2 equals the sum of the variances. And then, of course, if we take the square root of variance, we get standard deviation. It is, yes. It looks, like I told third period, it looks intimidating, it looks big. We're going to see several formulas that look big and intimidating. But once we do them enough, it's like, okay, this isn't so bad. It's like, don't let it. 
Don't let it work on the lines, basically. Take it step by step, and you'll be good. And then, so that's our mean, that's our standard deviation. If N1 and N2 are both large, or the population distribution are at least approximately normal, then X bar 1 and X bar 2 each have at least approximately normal distributions. Which implies that the differences will also be approximately normal. Can we go to the next slide or y'all still trying to write? Good. Okay, so the properties for the sampling distribution of X bar 1 minus X bar 2 implies that X bar 1 minus X bar 2 can be standardized to obtain a variable with the sampling distribution that's approximately the standard normal. Did you get those blanks, Charlie? Okay. So, when two random samples are independently selected, and N1 and N2 are both large, or the population distributions are at least approximately normal, the distribution of Z equals this is our test statistic when sigma is known. The test statistic for when sigma is known. That's what this Z gives us. Again, it looks like a big bad monster. But if I put these in parentheses right here, this really shouldn't look anything that much different than just a normal uh came in sync right now. A normal hypothesis statistic. We have our X bar minus our mu over the standard deviation. Just that this time we have two populations we have to take into account. Now this can be described by the standard normal. Now, for dual credit, this is what you'll use for 8.1. That assignment I gave y'all today. This is what you'll use. That's because we have one, the random samples. Two, they're independently selected. And three, they're large with sigma known. Large samples with sigma known. 
I just answered a question for y'all on the homework. You're welcome. So I was saying the three conditions are that random samples, independent, and then they're both large, or the population is normal distributed with sigma none. Yeah. Looks annoying. Looks annoying. I haven't seen annoying yet. We'll get there. Uh, just slightly. Just slightly. Just slightly. I haven't talked about degrees of freedom yet for T statistics. For one sample, yes. Two samples, we have a formula we have to follow. Because then we would have too much freedom. Okay. We're good on writing it down. Okay. So again, we must know sigma in order to use this procedure. For dual credit on 8.1, they tell you sigma. If sigma is unknown, we use the T distribution. I could have given y'all that assignment today, but I want to do one at a time. So I'll give y'all that assignment tomorrow. So let's talk about t-distributions now. So our null hypothesis is that mu1 minus mu2 is equal to some hypothesized value. Now, this hypothesized value is often zero, but there are some cases when we're interested in something not being zero. Now, for dual credit, what are our other options here for the null hypothesis? Yes, we can have equals, but what else can we have? Uh, not for null. Less than or equal to? Oh, great. Wait, that was greater than. Or greater than or equal to, yeah. Those are, that's the last thing that's greater than. Or we can, of course, have equal to. Now, AP, it's like it's always been, y'all are just going to stay equals. <laughs> they still have as far as one tail and two tail goes, just like y'all do. It's just really when you're even on y'all's case, it makes it easier really for y'all because for them it's just okay, boom, I know it's equal, but then you have to think about the alternative. For y'all, do the alternative and then just take the exact opposite and there's yours. So if you think about it though, when you're doing a test, a hypothesis test, so let's say you fail to reject the null, meaning it's less than or equal to in just this hypothetical case. Mm -hmm. It's less than or equal to. We still don't know if it's equal to or if it's less than. 
So if you really wanted to look at it, it's like, okay, I know it can be greater than, but I don't know if it's less than or equal to it. Does that make sense? Okay, test statistic. It looks similar to the one we wrote down for Z. Except we use T and S instead. I don't know why they don't do this. I like putting parentheses around this. That way I know this is the value I find from the problem. Just like in our other hypotheses, this is our value minus the hypothesized value. Just helps me to realize, okay, this isn't something totally new. This is just an extension of something I already know. I know how to do a hypothesis test for one sample. Let's just expand it for two. Now, here comes the curve. Like I said, degrees of freedom have to be difficult. And they try to be. They're really not that bad. They try to act all big and bad. Here's our formula for the degrees of freedom for a two sample t test. We have v1 plus v2 squared divided by v1 squared over n1 minus 1 plus v2 squared over n2 minus 1. No, that's still what it works. What you were talking about earlier about the zero? Yeah. Now, what I recommend on these, notice what this really is, is this is our variance. For population one, V here really is standing for variance. That's what the V stands for. Sample variance. So this is the variance of population one. This is the variance of population two. Calculate these first. Calculate these first, then plug in. Yep, the degree of me to write that down at the bottom of page two. And oh. Rosie, I don't know if you saw my email or my reminds, but I have the handouts ready for you whenever you get a chance. If you want to text your mom or something and let her know, or I emailed her too. But I have on, I have a packet with your name on it. Yes. Yes, you may. Okay, now on degrees of freedom, we need to truncate it. And by truncate, I just mean cut the decimal off altogether. If it's 15.15, we say 15. 15.70, 15. 
Don't even round it. Just cut it off. Truncate it. Don't even round. Just chop it off. Well, because if we think about degrees of freedom, let's say it's 17.6. Do I have a full 18 degrees of freedom? No. So I don't want to give myself 18 degrees of freedom if I don't have a full 18. Does that make sense? Yes. Remember, degrees of freedom means how much the problem, it gives us room for the problem to vary. The more degrees of freedom you have, the more variability you can have in your data. That's right. We round it up, we're giving ourselves more variability than what we really have. So. Now, if we were just in a pinch, we didn't know the variance, we didn't know anything, we didn't even not the variance. We didn't know the standard deviation. We didn't know the sample size. And we'd kind of be in a, early in a bind because you at least need to know sample size. But if we didn't know anything about standard deviation, we were in a kind of in a pinch, you could take the smallest of the degrees of freedom of either sample one or sample two. So, like I said, if we didn't know S for whatever reason, take the smaller of these two and use that as your degrees of freedom. So that kind of goes back to your question, Nate, about how would we go down? Yeah. You want to get probably get as low as you can. Okay, so for the hypotheses, top of page three. We already said the null hypothesis. And we also said that for dual credit, you can have less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. For the alternative, it's just like before. You can have greater than. If it's greater than, we have a which tail? Right tail test. So e1 minus mu2 is greater than our hypothesized value. Less than is which tail? It's a left tail test. And then not equal to is a two tails. So we would find one of the p values and then multiply it by two. Or if you were doing the rejection region like dual credit does, find one of the t's, which in y'all's case would be the positive t. And then add a negative t critical to it for two tilt. So, what I was saying here when you came in, it, all it was is we were just naming our different hypotheses. They're the same as we've had before. You could have your value being greater than the hypothesized, which in that case would be a right tilt test. Okay, gotcha. So really, as far as thinking, just trying to make the connection between what we've done already 
Yeah, same stuff. Just replace this with one big mu. And it would be the same concept. That makes sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, if our hypothesized value was zero, we could actually rewrite these hypotheses. But I since you have a blank space to do this, what I would recommend is you creating two columns. On my slide, it's not going to do it. The old's going to fade away to the new. But all we're really doing, if mu1 minus mu2 equals zero, really we're just moving this around algebraically. This would just give you mu1 equals mu2. This is another way you could write the null. U1 equals mu2. Now you don't have to show this math here. What I, what I was kind of getting at was, and what I did on my notes, I had this and then I drew an arrow. I said, okay, my name is going to be mu1 equals mu2. Because once I click next, it's going to fade away, old to the new, just like that. So, oh, go back too far. Okay, I'm going to erase this. So that's another way we could write the null if the hypothesized value is zero. If it's not zero, this won't work. I'll try it. Don't try this at home, kid. That's the old form. If it's equal to zero, we can turn it into that. So that's why I was saying let's create in your notes, create two columns, add the original and then the new version. Okay, for our first alternative option, where we're less than zero, what could this one turn into? Like here's the original format. What could this? What could the new version be? Well, mu one is less than mu two. That's our new version. So this is the old, this is the new. Yep. I keep it moving because I need that we need to get to a certain point today so AP can do their homework. I keep it moving. Okay, so mu one minus mu two is greater than zero. How can I rewrite that one? Mu one is greater than mu two. That would be the new version. I'm going to fade to the new one. And then our last alternative hypothesis, mu1 minus mu2. <coughs> excuse me. Mu1 minus mu2 is not equal to zero. How can I rewrite that one? Mu1 
Me one is not equal to me two. That's right. Now, when we do this, make sure you define B1 and B2. If we're talking about gas mileage and one population one is of Hondas, population two is of Toyotas, make sure you say B1, the mean gas mileage of Hondas. B2, mean gas mileage of Toyotas. Tell me what they are. And if you tell me what they are, that means you know what they are. There won't be that confusion. Okay, so we've got, as with any good hypothesis test, we've got to make assumptions here. So, for the assumptions, the two samples need to be independently Selected random samples from our populations. Independent random samples. Second assumption is that the sample sizes are large, generally 30 or larger. Or population distributions are at least approximately normal. So if we're not told we have a large sample, we have to check normality. And we can check two ways. We can use a box plot or we can use a normal probability plot. Now let's say we have two treatments that we're comparing. We don't want to compare populations, we want to compare treatments. Then the individuals or objects have to be randomly assigned the treatments. You can't have some systematic, you know, every other person gets this treatment, it's got to be random. Or we do it vice versa. We randomly assign the treatments the person. And then the second one's really the same as when we had pop just populations in general. The sample size must be large, meaning 30 or larger, or the treatment response distributions have to be approximately normal. Okay, questions on that? So far we've just done a bunch of terminology. Are ready to see this all in action? Bunch it. Now, I should have checked this before, but I didn't. On your notes handout. Is only half of y'all's data on the next example? Okay, I need to go fix that. Dang it. I was hoping it was just a, an issue I had with my printer. Is that for us too? What is that for y'all? The question you read? Yeah. If you look at your next page, yep, it did. Well, I thought you were talking about homework. No. If you look at your next page, only have your data printed. Alright, we can guess. No need to guess. I'm going to throw the numbers up there. I need y'all to fill them in if you can't tell what they are. Okay, so let's look at this example. So if you can't tell what a number is, make sure you look up on the screen and write it down. I'm going to put mine in right quick so I 
on the for the future. Yeah, one round. Yeah. To me, what gets me are the eights and the nines. Okay, I got my text. Okay, so not essentially studying, you men get paid more than women. And what they did was they looked at male purchasing managers versus female purchasing managers. And we want to test their hypothesis that males get paid more females at the alpha of 0.05. So the first thing we need to do is try to set up our hypotheses. Well, what is, what's in the problem? Males are greater than females. And believe it or not, there is still, if you do re really do research, unfortunately, there is still this problem in the corporate world. That males tend to get paid more than females. Now, in teaching, there's not that problem because all teachers, like a di the district has to publish, this is our pay scale. If you have this many years of experience, this is what you get paid. And that's what, but in the corporate world where they get to say, oh, I'm hiring you, I'm paying you this much. I'm hiring you, I'm paying you that much. Unfortunately, there's still some bias there. Anyways, what would this claim right here, remember, this is our claim. This is the claim. Would this be our null or would it be our alternative? Uh, does it have an equality aspect to it? The alternative. So, here, if you look below, they're using mu1 and mu2. So, mu1 is greater than mu2. That's going to be our claim. I'm going to write claim out here. Y way out there, you'll see in a second. That means the null would be what? For y'all, it'd be equal, yes. What about dual credit? Less than or equal to. Oh, we read that where it says new one means two. Yes, you'd write. You'd write this, yes. I'm noting out here that the second one's our claim. Now, I need to have a hypothesized value. But even though I can write my hypotheses like this, I need to know what to plug in when I do my test. So I'm going to rewrite them. U1 minus mu2 is less than or equal to zero. Mu1 minus mu2 is greater than zero. That 
way I know what to plug in. But what have I not done yet? In writing the hypotheses, what have I not done? Have it what? I haven't done the assumptions, but before we even do assumptions, what do we? So if I went out, I went, what's that? Yeah, go find the muse. What is, what's me one? The mean annual salary. For male purchasing managers. Okay, what's me too? That's gonna go What's me too then? Mean annual salary. Or female purchasing managers. And one thing I'll say on uh, to those of y'all that are AP, this example that we're working, you see how it's going to take up a whole page? That's how your homework should look on these. Everything we do here, you do on your homework. And you have a hypothesis test. I'm not going to talk y'all and throw rotten tomatoes at me. I haven't totally looked at chapter 10 homework yet for y'all. But I'm not going to count off if y'all don't do the full write-up chapter 10. But from this point on, I need a full write-up. Just like I mentioned in the review video, this is what we're going to want on the AP test. So this is what I need y'all to get. Which means you got to check assumptions, you got to do box plots, all that stuff. But the box plots are actually easier when you use your calculator to help you. I'll show you all that here in a second. Okay, questions on setting up hypotheses? If you've gotten the hypothesis set up or we're waiting for people to finish getting it written down, I want you to get your calculator and put the men in L1, women in L2. If you're done writing, put men in L1, women in L2. That way, when we get to that part, we can just boom, boom, get through it. You guys are all late? Okay. I'm going to put my data in right now. So let's everybody, even if you're if you're doing it now, great. If you're not, let's put our data into L1 and L2 right quick. I'm going to put mine in as quick as I can.
I'm just using the 10 key, which is the same thing y'all have on y'all's calculator. I mean. I can actually go quicker on the calculator. <laughs> This is slow. I wish I could go quicker, but then the computer won't pick it up. Yes. Okay, so we got it all in our bin. What I want to show right quick, even though we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves, we need it for the box plots that we'll have to draw eventually. I want to make sure AP knows where to get it from for their assignment, since we'll have to do this tonight. Okay, let's run one variable stats on L1 right quick. The stats, calc, one variable stats. L1, remember, that's our min. Okay. So we have our X bar, we have our sample standard deviation, and we have N. So let's write that right now over here on. I'm going to write it on the PowerPoint. So, U1 is min. So, N1. Oh, where's my. There it is. N1, sample size is 10. What's X bar 1? What's the mean? 74.6. Uh, I totally wrote that backwards. And then standard deviation to one decimal place. No, that's a sample. So S. S. Because we're dealing with the sample here. We don't have a population. 5.4. Okay, now don't clear that screen out because I want to show you all something. Um, this calculator can make these box plots super quick and easy. Because, look what it gives you. Yeah, min, Q1, median, Q3, and maximum. Uh, we will draw the box plot here in a second. I just wanted to show you all this on the screen so y'all will know. It's there. You don't have to sit there and order them and find it. Calculator does it for you. So the box plot's not as hard as you're probably thinking. Okay, let's run. I'll let y'all do this and you just kind of report to me what you get. So I can write it down. Run the one variable stats for the women. How do you do that? Okay, let's look. So we have women in L2, right? Stat calc. And this, we're still going to do one variable stats. But once you get to this screen, you'll have to do second and stat to pull up the list options. Y'all don't get that screen? So y'all just get the one where it's. Yeah. So second stat to get the list and pick L2.
to figure it out. Okay. So, what was in two then? The sample size of population two. Mm -hmm. And yes. in the calculator. So uh, you know how to get to the one variable stat page, right? For the calc and the one variable stats. Once we're to this point, is, do you get this screen or do you just get one that says one more stats with a parenthesis? What's that? And then it has a parenthesis for you to put something into? Okay, so you'll need to hit second and staff. That should bring you to this screen. And then you'll want to take L2. Enter, and then you should get the stats. Okay, so we had 10 for our sample size. What about our mean? What was our mean for this one? Oh, 64.6. 64.6, okay. Mm -hmm. What was the standard deviation? 8.6. Okay. If you scroll down, you can see the box plot information that we would need. But let's check our assumptions. So, given two independently selected random samples, the male and female purchasing managers, that was given in the problem. They told us it's a random sample. Now, you might be saying, but wait a minute. It. They subscribe to the same magazine. How is that random? The ones who did this study said that it's a, still a valid assumption. You know what they say. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to say they're random and they're independent. Even though they subscribe to the same magazine, we're going to go with it. Okay, second assumption. Since the sample sizes are small, we have to determine if it's plausible that the sampling distributions are approximately normal. From the box plots, we can tell that they are. So try to sketch the box, make sure you try to sketch box plots. Box plots are approximately symmetric, so we can assume normality. Okay, I need to keep going because we have seven minutes left and we haven't even done the test statistic. I got to keep going. Okay, test statistic. Are we still on that same page? Okay. Yeah, we're still on the same page. Okay, so we need to write our formula down. That way we know what we need to plug in. So this is the formula we're going to use. The X, the S, and the N come straight from our information that we found in one variable stats. The mu's here, remember that's our hypothesized value. We're gonna miss the last part of this. Okay, so I'm going to just plug the 
numbers in, and then if you all say, okay, this is what you should get if you calculated it correctly. That way we get the whole example done. So 5.4 squared over 10 plus 8.6 squared over 10. So you plug everything in, and we'll look like this. You calculate it, you get 3.11. That's your test statistic. Now, we're going to do the p-values. But to do that, we need to get degrees of freedom. So remember, degrees of freedom uses that formula V1 plus V2 squared over V1 squared and 1 minus 1 plus V2 squared over and 1 minus or sorry, this should be N2 minus 1. Okay, what are our Vs? Well, I have room up here, so I'm going to squeeze it up here. All really the Vs are is just each part of our standard deviation. 5.4 squared over 10. So we get you 2.916. V2, 8.6 squared over 10. 7.396. That's V1, that's V2. I'll get in. So 2.916 plus 7.396 squared over 2.916 squared. Now, N1 minus 1. We had 10 samples, so 10 minus 1 is... 9 plus V2, 7.396. Again, 10, 10 samples, so 10 minus 1 is 9. We put all this in the calculator. And we get 15.14, which means how many degrees of freedom do I have? 15 degrees of freedom. Two minutes. Okay. So, I mean, this is a greater than. I need mean my right tail. I need to do the probability. I'm just squeezing it all in here so we can get done. P is greater than 3.11. If we do this in our calculator doing the second bars to get the PCDF that I showed y'all the other day. Here we get the p-value of 0 0.004. How does that compare to my alpha? 0.05. It's less than. So p-val is less than alpha. So what's that mean we do? Mm -mm. P-value is less, so we reject a mock. I didn't get to go through it in as much detail as I wanted. Tomorrow, we'll really do an example in full detail. I just, I ran out of time. It's all good. We appreciate your work. But uh, AP, we have done enough. You should be able to at least reference the book to finish it. So.